My name is David Richardson. I'm the health officer here in Manalpin Township. Um, I welcome everybody here. Um, I'm very encouraged by this response. I, I think, uh, um, and I, I know uh, Bart, I've had an opportunity to work with him now a little bit, and uh, this is what he's looking for, to reach people, to uh, inform them and make them more aware of what's going on. Um, a couple introductory words, and then we'll get to, to Bart. Um, I, I met Bart, coincidentally enough, through some neighborhood cat problems. Um, but as being in the public field, the public servant, uh, we get to meet a lot of people, and I think it's one of the undervalued uh, aspects of our job is just being able to meet people and, and develop some relationships that you just don't expect. Uh, Bart's a long time an Alpen resident, so he's one of ours and he's been here a long time. Uh, he's, you know, been a successful business person and I know he has a, he has a very successful family life and some of his family are here today. Um, Bart is going to go into more of his details. I'm going to just kind of rough it out here a little bit, but somewhere in the vicinity of the year 2000, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, he was diagnosed with uh, cancer of the esophagus. Um, that's not a cancer we routinely hear a lot about, but um, it, it is something that we're here today to learn more about. But, you know, Bart's story kind of started there for us in this room today. You know, he survived the radical surgery that follows that with the radiation and chemotherapy. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the end of one story. And for me, the beginning of the, the, the most important story that I'm hoping to present here today, and, and that's what Bart did with that, uh, that aspect of his life, and really began a whole new life in developing um, means and ways, working with physicians, but also with patients to help them through the process that he experienced. And uh, taking that even further, developing a foundation that is now probably the leading uh, aspect of getting information into the community about the disease. Uh, he's a co-author on books and booklets, um, developed training DVDs for the medical field. Um, he's really invested, and I'm sure his family with him, has invested considerable time and, and resources to try and help the larger community of us to know more about esophageal cancer. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to turn the program over to Bart. And at the end of that, there'll be absolutely plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, and, and Bart is, is here to do as much as he can to, to present that information. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bart Fazita. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. It's amazing what cats can do. Let me start by giving you a little bit about me personally. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Went to school all my school life in Brooklyn. The last four years, I spent at St. John's University. Two major things happened at St. John's. One, I had a, an athletic scholarship at St. John's. And the second thing is I met my wife at St. John's. I met her in freshman year. We were both in the College of Business Administration, both studying to be accountants. We graduated in 1963 and got married in October 1963. So this year we celebrate 49 years of marriage. Uh, we moved to Manalapan in uh, 1969. So we've been here quite a while. We have two daughters and they have two great husbands. They've given us seven grandchildren, ranging in age from 22 down to six. And they're all a joy, and certainly worth living for. From a business point of view, I spent 44 years in the insurance and reinsurance business. Uh, we were a reinsurance consultant. Um, reinsurance, by the way, is the insurance of insurance companies, just to give you a perspective of what it is. I retired from a company called Chiltington in the end of 2007. I retired from the position of vice chairman and CEO of that firm. And that firm was part of a worldwide consulting firm with offices throughout the world. My story begins really in Hamburg, Germany. I was over there for a partner's meeting. We went out to dinner. I had a piece of steak. And it, as soon as I swallowed it, it got stuck in my chest. The pain was intense. I got up from the table, I thought I had a heart attack, and as I got up, the piece of meat cleared. 
Everybody around the table looked at me and said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm okay. So I sat down, but the rest of that week, I made sure everything I ate, I chewed very well. And when we got back to the United States, I happened to be at lunch with a, a client, and I had a hamburger, and the same thing happened. I said, there's something wrong here. I've got to go have it checked. So I went to our doctors, and she recommended I go through an upper GI series. We did that in the morning. I went home after it to rest. And she called me at um, probably around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she asked me if I was sitting down. I said, no, why should I be sitting down? She goes, just sit down. So I sat down. I said, what's the problem? She says, you have cancer. I said, cancer? Cancer of what? She said, the esophagus. I said, how could you have cancer in a tube? I said, I've heard of cancer of lungs, of kidneys, of, of you know, prostates, a whole bit, but never heard of esophageal cancer. She said she had it, and she said, I want you to go for an endoscope. <coughs> so the next day, she had scheduled an endoscope with a gastroenterologist locally, and went and had it done, and he confirmed that I had esophageal cancer. So I asked him, I said, where do I go from here? And he said, you need to find yourself a surgeon. So I asked him if he had a recommendation, and he said no. <laughs> so the one thing he did say, which was a shock, because I did ask him, I said, what caused this? And he asked me if I had heartburn. And I, and I said, I've had heartburn for 30 years. But I would take Tums in, in the morning or the afternoon or the evening, and it would be gone. He said, heartburn caused your esophageal cancer. I need to repeat that. Heartburn caused esophageal cancer. Once he told me he didn't have a name to give me, I decided to call a couple of friends who were in management positions at Johnson & Johnson and Merrill Lynch. The person at Johnson & Johnson uh, right away said, because I asked him, I said, if, if you're one of your executives had esophageal cancer, what would your in-house doctor recommend for the institution for him to go to? And whether or not he had the name of a surgeon that he would suggest I see. Johnson & Johnson came back immediately with Sloan Kettering and a doctor by the name of Dr. Manjit Baines. Merrill Lynch came back that afternoon with Sloan Kettering, but they didn't have a name. And about early evening, they came back with the name of Dr. Manjit Baines. At that same time, my sister-in-law, who, who stayed close to the surgeon who took care of my father-in-law at Sloan Kettering, she called him and asked him what he thought. And he thought Manjit Bain. So we had a schedule appointment with Manjit Bain. We had a CAT scan done. And we visited Manjit. I call him Manjit now because I know him well. And he looked at the scan that we had brought him, and he said, yes, I've confirmed that you have esophageal cancer, and you also have two lymph nodes, one in each lung, that are enlarged. They're not showing up as cancer, but before we do anything, I want to go in and take one of those, a biopsy, and determine what the status of that is. The reason for that is if it did have malignancy, then it would take the whole plan out of what they, had, they thought they would be doing, and put it into a whole different plan. The plan that they had come up with, after we went through all of the tests, the endoscope, EUS, EUS is an endoscope with ultrasound. That's how they determine the stage of your cancer and the size of your cancer. A CAT scan is a normal section. They take your chest, stomach, and your abdomen and your pelvic area, and, and it actually like slices, pictures slice parts of your anatomy, and they take that in, in that scan. The PET scan, you're pumping in a nuclear dye into your body, and, and along with the sugar glucose that they put in, if there's cancer in any part of your body, it'll light up. Okay. So the plan after all of that, they told me I had a staged centimeter tumor. They called it an adenocarcinoma at the juncture where my stomach and my esophagus meet. It's called a gastroesophageal juncture, right at the base. They said the plan that they had hoped that I would be able to do would be chemo 24 hours a day, five days a week, for six straight weeks. 
during the same period of time, they would administer 28 treatments of radiation. When that was over, they would let me rest for about two months, and they would put me through a surgery that would take approximately eight, eight hours to do. In that surgery, they removed two-thirds of my esophagus, and they removed one-third of my stomach, and effectively pulled up the remaining part of my stomach to attach to the remaining part of my esophagus. So for all intents and purposes, my in the middle of my chest. And it's quite often there's a fight between my stomach, my lungs, and my heart as who wins with the air and the breathing and all that good stuff. They said once they finished doing all of that, they said that the prognosis and the diagnosis would be that I have a 5 to 10 percent chance of living five years. When we thought about all of that, you know, the impact, here a cancer that I knew nothing about just a few months prior is going to give me an opportunity to just live five years and maybe have it a 5 to 10 percent chance of doing that. Created a lot of prayer, created a lot of decision-making as to what should we do. Should I go forward with this real massive program? Or should I just simply say, well, that's it, let's, let's let it happen. One of the things that I've always been noted for is coming up with sayings that kind of fit the situation. I remember in, 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 in the office, sitting at a meeting I was invited to, and there was a young kind of an executive sitting there and he was talking on and on and on and on, and some of the things he was ma saying were made sense, some of them didn't. After the meeting was over, I pulled him aside and I said, there's two things you need to think about. One, no one ever listened himself out of a job. And the second was, better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. So <laughs> those were two sayings that he lived with. And I needed to come up with something that I would live by. And I came up with this. God sits on my right shoulder, <clears throat> and there is nothing that he and I together can't handle. So we decided to execute the plan. In order to do the chemo the way they wanted to, 24 hours a day for five days a week and six week time frame, they needed to install a metaport. For those of you who don't know what a metaport is, if you looked at a golf ball, cut it in half, made it out of rubber, and then attach the tube to that. They'll place it, they place it under my skin, in my right, right by my right shoulder, and the tube went into a vein that went into my heart. So that effectively, when they hit that with the needle and started pumping chemo into me, the heart, because of its ability to push it out quickly, would push it through my entire system. And the key there with the the chemo was really to make sure that there was no cancer cells running around the rest of my body, and that chemo was intended to do that. The, the week that we had would start on a Monday morning where Ginny and I, my wife and I, would go into the city, and we'd go up to the hospital and get the radiation treatment, get back in the car, drive to the, the clinic on 53rd Street, have the chemo, they would put a bag Hit, hit, hit the metaport, put a bag on a pump around my waist, I would go home. Tuesday, Jim Anastasia, Wendell Becker, and um, Bob D'Ambrosia would drive me into the, to the hospital to get my, chemo, my radiation treatment and then home. Wednesday, we'd, my, Jenny and I would go into the hospital, get my radiation, go down to the clinic. They would take the old bag of chemo off, put a new bag on, and go home. Thursday, we repeated the Jim, Wendell, and Bob scenario going to the hospital for radiation and home. And then Friday, Ginny and I would go in, hospital, the, the clinic. They would take everything off, say, enjoy the weekend. We'll see you on Monday morning. And that, that we did for six weeks. The side effects, uh, although I really didn't have a lot of side effects from the treatment. They, they give you a whole list of things that could go wrong and you could experience. And, and I realized that um, I wasn't getting any of those side effects. 
the hair I have now was the hair I had then. Went through chemo, nothing fell out. I felt fine. Um, after about three or four weeks, I went to the doctors and I said, you sure this is working? You keep telling me about all these things that are going to happen to me and nothing's happening. And they said, no, the blood test reflects some, that things are working out well. <coughs> Excuse me. So I rested for a couple of months and then we went through the surgery. And again, it was an eight-hour procedure. And part of the surgery, um, Dr. Baines had gone into my, when, when I said at the beginning I had two enlarged lymph nodes and he had taken one, part of the surgery was that he was going to take the other one as well to make sure that that wasn't cancerous, and it wasn't. My hospital stay, I woke up in the recovery room at Sloan Kettering the, the, that afternoon. I had a myriad of tubes. A gastro tube goes through your nose into your stomach to clear out any bacteria in your stomach. I had two chest tubes on each side to clear my chest of any liquids, any fluids, so that it would be any, it wouldn't get any lung infections or pneumonias. I had a urine catheter, which really was a godsend. Thank you. And I stayed in the recovery room overnight, so the very next morning went up to the 18th floor at Sloan. 18th floor at Sloan is a thoracic floor. Every patient is either have lung or esophageal cancer surgery. As soon as you hit the floor, an hour after getting onto that floor, they had me up and walking. It was an ordeal to find a, 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 a pole that they could put all the vats on that I had, that they had, a, that I had to walk. At one point, they didn't have one, so the orderly came in with a wheelchair. I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, well, we're going to put all your stuff in it, and you're going to push it. And that's how I did it. And 14 laps around the 18th floor is a mile. And they expect you to do that every day, okay, at the minimum. Part of the need to work was not only the walking, but breathing. They would give you a spirometer, and they would say, we want you to exercise, exercise your lungs 10 times every hour. Do it repetit repetitively. And the same thing with, with coughing. Coughing was very difficult. The incisions they made was a, a, an incision that went from my belly button up to my chest bone. And then on my right side, all the way around to the middle of my back. So this, when you cough, your stomach vibrates. And that incision would, would just knock you out with the pain. So we, we learned to put pillows wrapped, hold them tight, and cough, and, and that worked. I stayed in the hospital 10 days, and then started the recovery process. As soon as I got home, Excuse me, it's my Italian heritage. You kind of think about how much time do I have left? If they're right in the 5 to 10% chance of living five years, I could be living a couple of months. Uh, what do I do? Okay. Should I retire? I certainly didn't want to die at my desk. I wanted to enjoy my family, wanted to enjoy life. So retiring became the option. The other question was, how would I live my life? What would I do? Would I allow all of what had happened to influence how I thought going forward would be? Okay, serious, serious thought process. I thought about that chance of living five years, and that was ever more prevalent as I got away from the surgery. Then I said, I said, would I allow that situation to dictate to me, how I would live my life. I recall as, as I went through hearing about this cancer that all of the things that I thought I was in control of, my, my destiny, where I was going, what I was going to do next year, the year after, what I was going to do in retirement, all were gone. And I realized I never really had control, that God had control. So if God had control, then why why am I going to be worried about when it's going to happen? I can't control it. Why worry about it? But I did decide at that point that I wanted to give something back. This disease had collared me, and it was unfair. So the need to want to help other people realize what this disease was all about became a prime motivation in what I did.
this was another saying that I came up with that actually came up with this saying many, many years ago. But it's something that I try to live my life even today. And that is make where you are better because you're there. I talked to Dr. Baines because when I said I wanted to give something back, it was really trying to see at Sloan Kettering what I could do up there that would help other patients. Dr. Baines had mentioned the patient-to-patient -patient program. And the purpose of the program is patients who have gone through a cancer come back and walk the journey with patients who are hearing about that they have that cancer for the first time. So it, it was a program that I thought I really liked and wanted to get involved with. Well, they told me I had to wait one year post-surgery before I could be part of that program. And that immediately brought back the statistics. Why are they waiting a year? Well, they don't want to train somebody and then lose them in a year. Okay, so it became very corporate-driven type of approach. So what happened was we, we, we got through the year, we became a member, and in talking to Dr. Baines, the, the program initially was that you saw patients in the hospital post-surgery. And I said to him, I said, you know, the anxiety that exists pre-surgery is much more prevalent than post-surgery. Why don't we try and get to see patients ahead of time? so that they're in a position of maybe being a little bit more comforted with what they're going to go through by seeing me. And he agreed to that. So the first time we did this was a patient um, who, who, thank God, is still here today. Uh, and, and literally, Dr. Ilson, who's an oncologist, the, the team approach works at, at Sloan Kettering. Dr. Ilson, the, the oncologist, went in and told him about the chemo and the radiation he was going to go through. And then Dr. Baines followed up with the surgery that I just mentioned. And after he was finished, he said to him, would you like to talk to someone who has been through all of this? He's here today. And he said, sometimes the people look and they're not sure what they're going to see. And they say, no, no, we don't want to see anybody. But he said he would convince them that they ought to see me. And when I walked in the door, it was like, if you could see their eyes bright, you get larger and literally say, hey, he doesn't look half bad. Maybe I can be that same way. And just by talking to them and the positiveness of it, the program really took hold. So much so that as that went on, all of the surgeons, and there are seven surgeons at Sloan Kettering that do the esophagectomy surgery, both minimally invasive and the Ivor Lewis procedure, all seven of them wanted me to see their patients. And we did that. Actually, this past year, I've spoken to 145 patients with esophageal cancer. And for the period of time that I've been involved with the patient-to-patient -patient program, through the end of last year, I've spoken to over 900 patients. One of the other things that we needed to do was everybody that you talked to went to the internet. And what they found on the internet really wasn't positive, number one, number two, some of it was actually incorrect. So we took on the project to do this CD-ROM. Uh, my picture is on there because Sloan Kettering thought it should be on there. I didn't have anything to say in that, and I would have preferred it not be on there, but it was. And the project we took on, Ginny and I said we would take on this project, and we talked to the Sloan Education Department. It was a $75,000 project to, to produce this. Okay? And, and the reason we wanted to produce this because several of the other cancers had similar CDs that people could take home, look at, and get valid information from. That they didn't have to go to the internet and be subject to the positive, negatives, the correct, and the wrong responses. So we went ahead and we, 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 we did this. And when we talked to the corporate Sloan Kettering, they asked us, how are we going to raise the money? And I said to them, we have friends at Johnson & Johnson, we have friends at Merrill Lynch, we're going to approach those people and see if they could help us. And they politely said, you can't do that. He said, we have major proposals in front of those two companies for millions of dollars, and we don't want you going in, swaying them away from anything they're going to do there by doing something for you. I said, well, I made a commitment to raise $75,000. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that just by individual donations. So they said, well, the only way you can do that is if you create your own 
entity and do it from there. We have no say in what you do if, if you do that. So as a product of that, Ginny and I created the Esophageal Cancer Education Foundation. Okay. And we had a very good uh, man who was a patient who I saw as he was going through the process, lived in Freehold, uh, join us in helping us with the foundation, helping us with the website. The initial website was designed by our daughter Jennifer, but he was instrumental in trying to get the foundation off the ground. <clears throat> we used to meet every Friday night in the Maury's on Route 9 for dinner. And about six months into his post-surgical um, process journey, he developed a recurrence. And uh, he subsequently died from the disease. He worked, <coughs> excuse me, he worked for Merrill Lynch. And he was a controller at Merrill Lynch. And before he died, he said, you have to get up to see Dr. Gemson, who was the medical director of, of, of uh, Merrill Lynch. And I promised him I would do that. About a month after he died, I went up to see Dr. Gemson. And he said to me, he said, you know, Dominic spoke highly of you. He said, I'd really like to help. How can we help? I said, the most critical thing now is I need $25,000. I said, we've been able to raise 25000 through personal donations. I said, we have a foundation who, a patient that I had spoken to, his wife was the treasurer of that foundation, and they've agreed to give us the last $25,000. So I'm short 25000 in the middle. And he said, well, okay, let me, let me give a call to our um, foundation, Merrill Lynch Foundation. Well, he called them, and they said, they're all tapped out. They don't have any money at all. And he was kind of saddened by that, but he said, after a while, he said, let me call the CFO, because Dominic worked for him. So he called the CFO, and the CFO asked a whole bunch of questions about who I was and what we were all about. And uh, he said, let me get back to you. So he hang, hung up the phone. He said, he's going to get back to us. I said, not today, I don't think. He said, well, he didn't say he was not going to get back to us today, but he didn't say he would, he would get back to us. Well, about two minutes later, the phone rang, and it was him saying we had the 25000 The mission statement for um, our foundation, one of, the, one of the statements is to bring awareness and educate the public and medical community about esophageal cancer. Okay, part of the way we do that is we now have an ambassador program. It's not quite finalized. But in this program, we're asking people to literally take the word about esophageal cancer, about uh, heartburn causing esophageal cancer, and, and bring it in, into the community. Okay. We have a letter that we've prepared that families have literally taken the position of sending that letter to their family members, their friends, their business associates, with the idea of informing them about esophageal cancer. And, and there's, there's also a donation part of that letter, a small donation part of that. It's a one-sentence part, but it's a program that we're putting out today. Meetings such as this uh, is a way of getting the message out to the people that esophageal cancer exists and that you should pay attention to it. As I mentioned, or I mentioned earlier to, to Dave, we last, a couple of weeks ago, spoke to the CBA Fathers Club. And uh, we're now, we're with that letter I just spoke to, spoke about was going to be given to all of the students as part of their service program to send that letter to all of their family, friends, and their mom and dad's business associates, hopefully. And, and the, the student that produces the most uh, addresses and names will invite them to our Day at the Races, which will be June 3rd of this year. And part of that uh, day at Mammoth Racetrack will sponsor a race. And the, the person who wins this contest will be one of the people who make the trophy presentation at that race. We, we tried radio announcements. We spent probably 120000 in trying to get the message across using WCBS 880 radio. And a ton of people heard it. We're told over 2 million people heard it. 
and we're grateful for that. Um, it, it didn't produce any revenue at all other than one, one um, attorney who happened to be in the process of talking to one of his clients that had a foundation himself needing to spend some money and they gave us some money as a result of that announcement. Uh, we have a marketing committee now that's looking to address corporations and foundations trying to get to employee newsletters, uh, trying to get any kind of, if they have a health day fair, to have a table at the fair so that they can learn about esophageal cancer. Second mission statement is to walk the journey with patients who have this disease. I mentioned the patient to patient program earlier that we have at Sloan. We now do the same thing for Hackensack Medical Center, for Mount Sinai, and for Beth Israel. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm talking to patients of surgeons in those institutions that are performing esophagectomy surgeries. Patient services that we provide is we have support group meetings for patients and caregivers. These support groups are conference call support groups, so people don't have to leave their homes. Literally pick up their phone at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night, and they can, uh, it's once a month, and they can dial in a number, an 1-800 number, and then the operator will prompt them with a, a code to put in, we'll give them that code, they'll put it in, and they'll be connected to that conference call. We have guest speakers from the, that, are, that are participating in this as well, doctors, surgeons, nutritions, uh, nurses, the whole nine yards. We also found that there was a need to support loved ones who lost someone to this disease. So we've created a support group meeting for people who have lost a loved one to this disease. Same concept, it's a conference call approach. For that particular meeting, we do have a social worker who participates and directs that meeting so that, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, an area that obviously I haven't experienced, Ginny hasn't experienced, and so having a professional who has training in that area has really been a plus. We have a hotline phone number that we have on our website that literally gives people an opportunity to call if they have a quality of life question. Any medical question, we tell them, make sure you deal with your own doctor. But if you have a quality of life question about eating, sleeping, physical activity, emotional, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can handle it. And the last thing is quarterly, we put out a newsletter. We have copies that Dave has given to all of you. That's the last newsletter we put out this, this past year end. Publications. One of the other things we did with Sloan, because again, that information that was being uh, presented via the internet was so uncertain and, and sometimes incorrect, is that we produced the book called 100 Questions and Answers About Esophageal Cancer. This book is, is published by Jones and Bartlett. Dr. Baines and myself and two nurses that work with him are the authors of that book. That book literally takes you through the beginning phases of the cancer. It tells you about the chemo treatments, it tells you about the hospital stay, about the surgery itself. And we felt that there really wasn't a document that effectively helped patients post-surgery when they leave the hospital. There are a lot of issues that we confronted because of the new body configuration we have, stomach issues, breathing issues, sleeping issues, um, physical issues, emotional issues, they, they all come into play. So we felt that we needed to put out a guide that would help patients through that part of their journey. So through the medical advisory committee of the foundation was made up a whole bunch of doctors and surgeons and oncologists and gastroenterologists. We produced this book, just recently came out in January. So we think the two books basically can give a patient the whole gamut of what they will need to know about the, the cancer, about the treatments available, and the post-surgical issues that they will encounter. I mentioned the CD-ROM, and that's also available. The third mission statement that we have is to support research projects that will lead to an early detection of this disease. We, we just, in 2011, we gave $50,000 to Sloan Kettering as part of a $100,000 grant, they are working on a biomarker that will lead to a blood test that will, that will determine esophageal cancer. So we felt a blood test, a lot more people would do that 
rather than going for an endoscope. I mean, you talk about colonoscopies and you talk about endoscopes and in the same sense that, that people would prefer not to do those things. So hopefully this blood test will, will suffice. In 2012, we've committed $80,000 in grants. 50000 would be to that uh, biomarker research project that we gave 50000 to uh, last year. And the other one is Mount Sinai is one of four institutions that have been given this new endoscopic machine. And it, it sees cells a thousand times greater than the old machine. And they're working on a dye that when they spray it in the area, they'll be able to see cancer cells at a subcellular level. So that's really finding out the cancers at, at the earliest possible stage. So we're supporting that, that one as well. In conclusion, all I can say is cancer gave me a future after my working career. Um, it, it really has given me an opportunity to give something back. It's making a difference. And my last comment is to stop and smell the roses. Life is precious. The, um, you know, I often say that God gave us our life. What we do with that life is our gift to him. So that's something. And then it's still, this saying will stay with me, I think, for as long as I live. And it's God sits on my right shoulder, and there is nothing that he and I together can't handle. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bart, um, for a wonderful emotional uh, story and presentation. Um, all due respect to physicians, it might be one in the audience, I don't even know, but I mean, who knows more about what's going on with esophageal cancer than Bart? I, I, I would be far, I, I'd be pretty, I think it's a stretch to think he, anybody could probably produce more information about the subject than he can at this time. So um, Bart does want to spend a few <coughs> minutes answering your questions. What we'll probably do is if you can just raise your hands, we'll call a few people. Um, either I'll get you the microphone or I'll repeat your question because, again, it is televised and we want to kind of communicate the whole message as best as we can. So uh, we'll take a few minutes to uh, <coughs> have any questions. Before the uh, steak dinner in Hamburg, were there any other symptoms? I, I always had heartburn, okay? Uh, and over the years, and I'd say good 20, 30 years of heartburn. But like I said, you take a couple of tons, it would go away, and it wouldn't come back the next day or the day after, but then it would come back a day after that. So that was the only symptom I had. And there was nothing out there that said at that point that heartburn can cause cancer. So... No, there was other than that. After uh, going through that intensive chemotherapy and radiation uh, treatments, uh, was there a reduction in the growth in the esophagus where perhaps surgery was something that could have been avoided? Good question. Um, in my case, the tumor went from a five centimeter tumor down to a one centimeter tumor, okay? But in a lot of cases, the tumor disappears, okay? The recommendation is even if the tumor disappears, the tissue where that tumor was is very weak. It's susceptible to having it come back again. And when it comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. So you may be scanning every three months to make sure it doesn't come back. And if it does come back, it could al already be a metastasis. So the recommendation, I mean, people have decided not to go through the surgery, and some of them are alive a major number of them are not alive because of that metastasis. So the, the recommendation that surgeons at Sloan is that you still go through the... In fact, even though the cancer, in my case, went down to a one centimeter can, this size, Dr. Baines, when he did the surgery to get all that tissue out, treated as if it was still a five centimeter tumor, so that any of the tissues that it was in came out with the surgery. Two more questions. 
Uh, real quick, uh, I had the same exact surgery uh, 15 months ago at Mount Sinai Hospital with uh, Dr. Tomas, Dr. Tomas Hyman. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I was affected with the Agent Orange, and I was just wondering, are there any veterans that have come across this with this disease that you know of? Uh, not that I've been aware of, no. no. Uh, um, just checking on it. doesn't seem to have a tie to I that at all. So. Yeah. Okay. And I'm in the process of going to Columbia Presbyterian now. They found a couple more cells uh, okay. that, they're, that they're trying to freeze for me. But I'm um, good, and God is good. Good. Great. What changes did you make to your lifestyle after your surgery in terms of diet and exercise? What were the recommendations to help you? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, diet. Um, because they've taken a part of your stomach, you need to eat more meals, smaller meals, before you're eating three meals a day and maintaining your, your weight. Well, your stomach can't hold enough food in three meals for you to maintain your weight. So you need to eat six meals a day, two breakfasts, two lunch, two dinners. Okay? Effectively, what you ate before, divide it in half and have it twice. Eight o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock, lunch, have a half a sandwich, two o'clock, have the other half, that type of thing. Sleeping, they take the valve, the sphincter valve that's on top of your stomach that holds everything in your stomach. So when you lay flat, because your stomach would be higher than your head, everything would just gravity roll up and you could aspirate. You could literally die from that. Okay, so you need to sleep on an angle, usually a 25 to 30 degree angle. It can be done by a wedge. It can be done by an adjustable bed. It can be done by a reclining chair. <laughs> whatever, whatever best suits you. The key to everything is everybody's unique, everybody's different. So whatever you can get a good night's sleep doing, that's what you should do. Okay. From an exercise point of view, and the book covers all of this, is that when you get out of the hospital, you tend to say, thank God it's over, and you kind of become a couch potato. Well, that's the worst thing you can do. You need to keep up the exercising, whether it's 12 or 14. I know it's 14, but if, if <laughs> maybe the ladies' version at 12. But, but you need to continue that exercise. You need to exercise um, um, three times a week, at least a mile, mile and a half walk. You need to be able to get your blood circulating, get everything moving. Effectively, when you get out of the hospital, you won't have an appetite. So the meals that I was talking about earlier, you're going to have to eat by the clock. It says 12 o'clock, have half a sandwich. 2 o'clock, have the other half. Even though you're not hungry, you need to make sure you maintain your body weight. And you're only going to be able to, the only way you're going to be able to do that is by eating, okay, drinking calories and whatnot. Um, emotionally, um, people do go into a depression. They tend to feel they've been through it all. They don't know what the future is holding, and they just become couch potatoes. And exercising, we find, is really the key to resolve that, unless you're getting into a real deeper depression, and then you really need to talk to a, a physician to, or a psychiatrist or whoever. But that's really the difference is that lifestyle. I play golf now, as I did before. I'm three strokes worse than I was before. I like to think that's old age as opposed to the disease, but we don't know. <coughs> Any other questions? You got a copy of our newsletter. There's our website on it. Take a look at it. It has a whole bunch of information on there for you. Uh, if anybody likes, likes to join the foundation, please do so. It doesn't cost anything to join, and we'll send you that newsletter every quarter. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Any questions? I'm sure Bart's going to spend a few minutes breaking down. He'll be more than willing to speak to people.